In January 2022, the Fuels Institute published this report, Life Cycle Analysis Comparison, Electric and Internal Combustion Engine Vehicles. This short presentation is designed to provide you a high-level overview of the methodology used to execute the research and a highlight of the key findings that came from the project. You'll be able to download your free copy of the full report at fuelsinstitute.org. First of all, the Fuels Institute Commission Ricardo Strategic Consulting to do the project. We wanted to look at the life cycle environmental impact of electric and internal combustion engine vehicles, the energy sources that power those vehicles, and the economic impact of each on consumers. The purpose is to inform stakeholders about opportunities to improve the environmental performance of both vehicle systems while delivering to end users the most cost-effective means of transportation. We start off the project doing a literature review. And Ricardo actually found more than 130 papers and reports that were relevant to life cycle analyses for fuels and vehicles. Um, from there, they were able to come together with a, a set of common assumptions that seemed to prevail across the, the research they reviewed and identified some of the most uh, prevalent studies to kind of benchmark against. Um, after that, they took the assumptions and ran it through the Argon greet model so they would have a transparent, publicly accessible uh, model to do the LCA and use that model to validate the uh, consistency of their assumptions and the accuracy of the literature they reviewed. Once they calibrated the model, then they started looking a little more deeply into the life cycle impact and components of the vehicles. Um, Using that model and those assumptions, they broke down the life cycle assessment into material extraction, manufacturing assembly, operating cycle, vehicle life management, after life management, basically to find out where are emissions occurring throughout the life of a vehicle. After they did that, they then started making some adjustments, some key variables to find out what impact that would have on the overall emissions profile of the vehicle. So they changed lifetime miles, they changed grid intensity, ambient temperature, driver behavior, vehicle weight, battery chemistry, density, biofuel blends, all to find out what impact they would have on a vehicle's life cycle emissions profile. <clears throat> this slide provides the high-level overview and summary of the research. Uh, the assumptions assumed a 200,000 mile lifetime, and this chart shows you what the impact would be using a national average electricity mix. And in that scenario, a battery electric vehicle um, is calculated to emit about 40% fewer tons of greenhouse gases over its life cycle than an internal combustion engine vehicle. Meanwhile, a hybrid electric vehicle has about a 29% lower emissions profile. And this is broken down into five different categories, and the uh, box to the right shows you what is going into each component represented in the chart. And that breakdown helps us better understand where opportunities may exist to have an impact on the life cycle emissions. And this chart shows you that emissions come from different stages of life based upon the vehicle. And if we want to reduce carbon from the electric vehicles and combustion engine vehicles, we need to focus on different areas. For example, on the combustion engine, 73% of emissions come from vehicle operation. That is miles traveled, the burning uh, liquid fuels in the engine. That's the majority of the emissions. So if you want to address life cycle emissions for a combustion engine, you need to look at that fuel, that fuel sector. On the electric vehicle, 72% of emissions come from electricity generation. So if you want to have a discernible impact on the life cycle emissions in electric vehicles, we need to focus our attention on making the grid lower carbon intensity. There's another opportunity here in the bottom right. Um, we look at manufacturing and material sourcing. The emissions from that stage of a vehicle's life are about two times higher for an electric vehicle than they are for the combustion engine vehicle. While it's not a major component of a life cycle emissions, I think it represents an opportunity that we can reduce the carbon intensity of an EV by looking at the material sourcing and manufacturing section of its life cycle to see where opportunities may exist to uh, reduce its overall carbon intensity. So focusing on where we can have the greatest impact on emissions reduction is a key output from this report and helps us focus our attention to where it can have the most uh, value. <clears throat> now, when we started doing the sensitivity analyses, 
we took a look at a variety. So this chart here shows you what percent impact, what percent change in carbon emissions came from these different scenarios based upon that baseline that I showed you a moment ago. And we looked at if we, instead of driving 200,000 miles, what if we drove 100,000 miles? What if the vehicles operated in a low carbon electricity grid, high carbon electricity grid, extremely high carbon electricity grid? What if the ambient temperature averaged 10 degrees colder Celsius or 20 degrees Celsius colder? What if the driver was aggressive or very aggressive? And you take a look at this and you see the variability and the impact of these different uh, factors can have on the life cycle emissions. There's nothing more uh, poignant in terms of impact on carbon emissions than the conditions of the grid. And when you start changing the carbon intensity of the grid, you have major variability in life cycle carbon assessments for the uh, electric vehicles. Now, one of the arguments I hear a lot is, you know, electric vehicles don't do very well in cold weather. And you see a little bit more sensitivity to cold weather for the battery electric vehicle, but not demonstrably so. Um, internal combustion engine vehicles get lower, lower, uh, fewer miles per gallon when you have uh, your heater cranked, uh, just like you do with the battery electric vehicle. A um, little more uh, pronounced than the BEV, but <clears throat> on an uh, average basis, not that much. So the real main variable is going to be in that uh, grid carbon intensity, which we'll turn to now. So this chart breaks down the life cycle carbon emissions of each vehicle in a low carbon, high carbon, extremely high carbon grid. And I think the key here is to see what happens. Uh, the, we saw the variability about 41% uh, lower carbon emissions for battery electric vehicle on a national average. When you're in a low carbon grid, heavy renewable electricity generation, that difference is about 73% cleaner. 73% uh, fewer uh, tons of greenhouse gases for an, for an electric vehicle compared to a combustion engine vehicle, 30% lower for a hybrid vehicle. Now, when you get to a higher carbon grid, things start changing the advantage of a battery electric vehicle drops at 13 percent relative to a carbon to a combustion engine vehicle yet the hybrid electric vehicle actually has a lower uh, life cycle carbon uh, emissions profile than the battery electric vehicle on a high carbon grid now that's a grid that probably has a lot of natural gas and and some coal mixed in there when you go to extremely high carbon grid that's likely going to be dominated by coal fired power plants the battery electric vehicle has a higher life cycle carbon emissions than the combustion engine vehicle. And so you start seeing that where the vehicles are being run, where they're being deployed, has an impact on their effect on the environment. And so if we're going to be strategic about reducing carbon emissions of transportation, <clears throat> understanding deployment strategies and trying to get the most benefit from the implementation of technologies should be high priority. And as the grids, as the electricity grid becomes more renewable, lower carbon intense, then the variability in regions start to mitigate. And there's not as much uh, differential between different areas of the country. But as for right now, there's significant variability. And understanding that and being uh, thoughtful about how we deploy our vehicles uh, makes a lot will make a lot more sense. And in some cases, maybe the hybrid electric vehicle or a highly efficient internal combustion engine vehicle is better for the environment than, a, than an electric vehicle in certain markets. And understanding that's important as we go forward. <clears throat> the other thing we want to look at is the combustion cycle for the internal combustion engine. How do we reduce the carbon intensity of the fuel? And right now, the most immediate opportunity there is to use biofuels and renewable fuels and blend it in with a petroleum uh, base uh, blend. The challenge is whether they be regulatory or technical compatibility issues, there is a there are blend restrictions in terms of how much biofuels can be blended into the petroleum uh, product, especially with regard to ethanol. You're looking at 10% or 15%. What that does, it reduces the overall benefit of the biofuels on the life cycle emissions of the vehicle. Um, so if you can't use a high blend of biofuels, the benefit of that biofuel is, is uh, mitigated. And plus the fuel consumption is only a component of the life cycle emissions of the vehicle. It is an important component. Um, but I think if we start thinking about how do we improve or increase the use of biofuels, you start seeing evidence that that can have a benefit. When you look at the diesel columns here, um, biodiesel blended at 20% has a lower carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions profile than straight run diesel. Renewable diesel, 100% uh, utilization is much lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions 
than regular diesel, there's lessons to be learned here. And if there's an opportunity to increase the uh, use of biofuels in the gasoline and diesel being burned in combustion engine vehicles, the overall impact on life cycle carbon emissions can be enhanced. But there, there needs to be some changes to how the market is structured and how the regulations are structured to enable that at this point. The final thing we want to look at was total cost of ownership. This breaks down the 10-year cost of ownership for an ICE hybrid and battle engine vehicle. Um, you break it down by capital costs, insurance, fuel costs, maintenance and repairs, and the total at the bottom there. It's important on the battle engine vehicle, um, the acquisition cost is much higher than the competing vehicles, and this is without tax incentives and tax credits. We know that the uh, cost parity is only a few years away by most estimates, but as of right now, it is a higher acquisition price. Significant savings on fuel costs, both with the hybrid and the battle engine vehicle relative to the combustion engine vehicle. So you see a significant change there. Um, we do factor into this chart the uh, likelihood that you can have to replace the battery in a battery electric vehicle at least once over a 10-year period. So that is factored in the maintenance and repairs costs. But even so, with all that taken into consideration, the battery electric vehicle presents a lower total cost of ownership than the combustion engine vehicle. The hybrid vehicle presents the lowest cost of ownership. And when you combine that with the fact that some markets where the grid is higher carbon intense and negates the benefit of a battery electric vehicle, a hybrid vehicle might be the best strategy from an economics perspective for the consumer, but also from an overall life cycle carbon emissions. So the total takeaway from the study is there are opportunities to improve the emissions of all vehicles. There are opportunities to be strategic about how we deploy different vehicle technologies in different regions that have the best impact on carbon emissions. And there are times when maybe Combining the environmental impact with the economic benefit of one of these technologies makes a, a lot of sense, both for the environment and for consumers. So balancing consumer needs with environmental needs is important. It's really important to recognize that there is no one size fits all. We cannot take one technology, take it across the entire country and every market, expect the same results. Um, being cognizant of the variabilities and the differences here can have a significant impact on improving our strategies to reduce carbon emissions from the grid. And with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, please visit fuelsinstitute.org. There you can download your free copy of this report. You can access the executive summary. We did do a podcast recording with the authors from Ricardo discussing the study. We are linking different articles or relevance to the study at this page and other related information. So kind of your one-stop shop for anything on uh, life cycle assessments that the Fuels Institute has done. With that, I will close. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.